11.30, back on the show, taking you up until noon. Calvin at that point, that it's Michael K. Until 6.30, that it's Game 4, Rangers Caps. And right now we continue with baseball. Let's bring in the doctor, Mr. Rick Peterson, live in studio. Rick, how you been, buddy? Great. Absolutely outstanding. What in the world is wrong? with? I ask you this every week. What is wrong with Ali Perez, and how do you fix him? Well, I think the biggest thing is, is with uh, with Ali, as, as, and they, they talked about it last night actually on the air, um, talking about the fact that, you know, you have to repeat your delivery in, in a consistent basis, and you have to keep your consistent arm angle. And, and I think the biggest thing with, with Ali is that, number one, he changes his tempo too often. Sometimes he's too fast. Sometimes he's too slow. And when that happens, it's like if you if you ever drive with somebody and, and you're the passenger and they drive with two feet, they got one on the brake and one on the gas pedal, and you feel like you're going like this the whole time. You get nauseous, like you watch, like you get nauseous watching a pitch. <laughs> Becomes a very uncomfortable ride. It does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Without yes, question. Does. And I think that that that's the biggest thing. And then then you start to lose your focus, and you know it's very difficult to to repeat consistent quality pitches when you when you when your delivery has. Different tempo, different rhythm, and you keep changing arm angles. You, mm-hmm. it's hard, you're hard pressed to name a real class, top of the line rotation guy that that changes arm angles. But Rick, how over the years we've seen some very unique deliveries. Mm-hmm. Juan Marichal, sure, okay, absolutely. Louis Tion, where he right. actually turn away from, the, from the catcher, and they Fernando Valenzuela look up at, at, at the at the planets. Right, they found the way to make it work. Is it? So I, I don't want to say I don't buy that because I know that it does make sense, but how could they do it and, and he can't find a consistent arm slot? Well, when you bring that up, I mean, you're talking about three guys that are, are kind of like freaks. Those aren't the norms. you know. So when you talk about guys who are really the norms, and those guys were unique pitchers. The, mm-hmm. Those guys, you know, it, it's kind of like, uh, was it Beethoven, one of the greatest composers of all time? He was deaf. How do you explain that? You know, mm-hmm. So would it be good to put ear, earplugs in when you're composing? I don't think so. You know, So when you take a look at the, the Valenzuelas and the – Juan Marichels and those kind of guys, and Louis Tion, th- those are freaks of nature. Those are really different guys. But if you look at the classical guys, you know, the Ma- the Mike Maddoxes and the, and the Tommy Glavins and the Santanas and all those guys, but those guys repeat their delivery on, on a consistent basis. And mm-hmm. and I, I say it tongue-in-cheek as a pitching coach, when you really when you talk to pitchers, you're a professional glove hitter. Your ability to hit the glove, so I tell the guys, literally, when you're in there in a the group, every week when you get, every two weeks when you get your paycheck, Take a look at what it is, and the guys who are getting paid the most money, they hit the glove the most. I mean, so even though you look at guys and go, wow, he's got great stuff. This yeah. guy's got unbelievable stuff. He does, but they don't miss the glove. That, and that's a, that's the unique part of what makes him so good. It's a good way to look at it. Former Mets pitching coach Rick Peterson live in studio. Um, Rick, how much value do you place on the actual receiver? I mean, is there a, if, if the catchers were better, could they make Ali Perez more consistent, or is it just solely on him? I think it's a combination. That's why they call it a battery. Obviously, you know. There's but there's a, a lot of merit behind that. There's it's a, no just, question. Okay. There's a lot of connection. Tell me why. Well, number number one, it, it's the ability to give a good target. It's the ability to communicate. Really, the catcher, the catcher during a game is really like your pitching coach. You know, once that game starts, his ability to communicate effectively, and it's not only visual. I mean, communication is also through expression. It's through touch, and 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 often when you see, you know, catchers. You know, you look at Carlton Fisk back in the day. Carlton Fisk was always running out to the mound. I mean, he was always communicating effectively. Tim McCarver, I mean, I'm talking about some guys. You know, even when you look back, uh, um, even I think it was in Don Larson's perfect game, you know, Yogi Berra was, you know, there, he made trips out to the mound. I mean, he's talking to the guy all the time. And it's, and it's almost like it's really very similar to, like, riding a horse. You know, and pitchers like Ali, they're, they're like horses. You can't let them drift off a little bit. And I've always said, like, to, to, uh, as Ali in, in analogy – Ollie's like a kite, and sometimes like you better hold on to that string because if you lose the string, that kite you go, whoa, where's? <laughs> hey, Never come on back. back, yeah, come on back, and 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 that's why as soon as he starts to drift, well, you better get out there now and you better stop it right now because sometimes he'll just start drifting off and you can't get him back. But Rick, at what point, either as an organization or fans, whomever, do you say, all right, enough about the potential and about what he might eventually become? And it becomes more about what he really is. He's a sub five hundred pitcher. I know he's on bad pirate teams. I understand that, but there, it, it, it's it's he's so unpredictable. Maybe this is just what he's going to be. Well, this is what he's been for. Yeah. So this is what he's. So been why is that going to change? I, I'm not suggesting that it would, uh, but mm-hmm. I but I do think that the biggest factor with guys like Ali is that they have to be. You have to really get a very structured, very disciplined. Um, structure for him so that when he goes into bullpens and, and he starts the game, 
it has to be really structured. And actually, when you look at this is the this is the unique part about Ollie. When you look at the games that he's pitched in an American League ballpark when he's not hitting, his his games are so much better because that whole distraction of hitting. And when you see him come to the plate or get on base, I remember a game uh, two years ago when Ollie got on base, he stole second base, he ended up getting a third. You know, and he's like jockeying down like he's going to steal home. And he come in. After, he ended up scoring. He came in, and I said, "Ollie, what you know? What are you doing?" And he goes. Rick, I'm playing a baseball game. I said, yes, yeah, you are. Yes, you are. And I think sometimes, you know, he just gets so distracted and he gets so out there that, that, he, that he, under, he, he fails to realize that this is all about one pitch at a time and executing that pitch. And, you know, it has to be very structured. For wow, that's, that's a real different way of looking at it, Rick, because so many people say you go to the AL and once you finally get away from that and you rid yourself of, of a DH and, and a more potent lineup that you would flourish in the NL, you're telling me that this guy pitches better Facing a DH because he doesn't have the distraction of actually running the bases or batting. No question. Wow. No question. And and even when you watch him hit, I mean, it's almost like a joke. Sometimes he he's Ichiro. Sometimes yeah, he is. Uh, yeah, he's, just, he's a quirky guy. <laughs> he's a, he's a really different guy. I mean, he's a left-hander. There's no question about it. <laughs> Do you think the Mets really, or, or I should say, how much did they wrestle with re-signing him? That's a good question. I, I wasn't involved with any of that negotiations, or I wasn't close to that situation at the time, so I really don't know. But I, I think the fact that. He was there. He won 15 games two years ago, and and you look at you know what Ali potentially again, and and that's why when you say like you, let's say you bring up Johan Santana, nobody talks about Johan Santana's potential. No. They talk about his performance, and and Ali still has a big gap between potential and performance, and and you're always trying to bridge that gap, but it comes down to a certain time when, you know, when it's a commitment. You know, mm-hmm. let, let me let me say this: when you look at the guys that are really best and really great. That's a high price to pay for success, and those guys pay that price, and they pay it with quality repetitions, with quality preparation, because preparation equals performance. And and I think when you look at Johan Santana, you, you, there, there's nobody that outprepares this guy. I mean, there's other guys that prepare equally, but mm-hmm. this this guy is. So, you watch his bullpen, and if they had a camera on his face in the bullpen, when when he's when nobody's around, and, you know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. You would, and you put his, you put a camera on his face in, in in a game with runners on base, and he's got to make a pitch. It's the same. It's the same mental intensity. It's the same focus. It, he he goes there, and this is a mission. He's on a mission every time he makes a pitch. He's gonna nail. The, he's gonna nail it. He's gonna hit the glove. But Rick, that also implies that not everyone does that, and that, and not to put words in your mouth, but it seems like if if Johan, if we credit him with such an intense, focused bullpen session, don't we also have to say that there's a lot of guys who go out there and either don't give a damn or don't have a clue? I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that they don't give a damn or don't have a clue. I don't think that they really know how to how to have that laser kind of focus like somebody else. I mean, yeah. you, you take a look at Michael Jordan or you take a look at Kobe. You look at look at their shooting percentage in the last 10 seconds of a game when all the money's on the table. It's higher probably than it is in the middle of the game. You know, why is that? And I, and I was in Chicago when Michael Jordan was playing baseball, and I asked him that question. I said, you know, your shooting percentage in the last 10 seconds of a game was remarkable. I mean, how, how do you explain that? He said, Rick, but before before I shot that, before I took that shot, I, I made that shot a hundred times in my mind. Mm. You know, so he he was already there. And I think that that mental preparation, that ability to see yourself, you know, be incredibly successful. And I think some guys, even when they get at that cusp of whether whether you're gonna be an elite guy or gonna be just okay, they're not comfortable. They're not com- they they'd rather be like Clark Kent. They don't want to walk in that in that phone booth and put that cape on, you know, every fifth day. And and some guys are just uncomfortable when they get to that level, and that and that's what you see with Ollie. That's why you see, you see two three spectacular innings, and you're going, wow. I mean, he he's on a roll. And what what do they always say about great starting pitching? You better get him early because if you don't get him early and they settle in, that's it. The game lights over. out at that point. With him, you, you never know. You, you never know when when you're going to lose the string of that kite. In studio today. Uh, Rick Peterson, you can always check him out on rick-peterson.com. And uh, we're talking about uh, Ali Perez. When we need the doctor, we usually talk about Ali. But also quickly here, Rick, the Moneyball movie, you are going to uh, take on a consulting role, and Brad Pitt is playing Billy Bean. How about that? Yeah, that's unbelievable, isn't it? It really is. It's really wow. exciting. It's uh, you know, it's one of those uh, you know, Mr. Magoo goes to Hollywood opportunities, <laughs> and I get a chance to play myself in the movie. And, I want to uh, be in the movie. Now right. I'm not. I want to be an extra. I don't care if I'm, you know, the backup, reserve, fifth outfielder. <laughs> I want to be in this movie. Well, it was actually kind of funny because Steven Soderbergh, the director, in our conversation said, uh, "Rick, would you be interested in playing yourself in the movie?" I said, "Geez, I play myself every day in my own movie. I might as well do it in this one." <laughs> so, but you know, it's funny. They say, "Yeah, you play yourself," but 
in a strange way, it's there's pressure to actually play yourself perfectly when the cameras roll. When somebody says be yourself, you don't really think about it. Oh, I'm, I'm just I'm just doing what I do. But then when the camera's there, you're more aware, more cognizant of being yourself, and you might not be yourself necessarily. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, I, I, I was asking Stephen that because a lot of guys are going to play themselves in a movie. I think David Justice is going to be in there, Jim, okay. Jim Masir, uh, Mike McNanny. Masir the pitcher, of course. Right, Jimmy's, Jim Masir the pitcher. Um, Art Howe is, is possibly going to play himself in the movie. And, and when I asked him, I said, geez, are, are you comfortable with all of us? You know, I mean, we don't, we're not actors. And, you know, his reply was that he said, you know what, it really brings a realism to a movie. He said, in my last few movies, I've started doing more and more of those kind of scenes with people that were actually, you know, themselves in, in, in the movie and those kind of guys. And he said, what I'm really looking for, he said, if I get the set all right and, and Art House office looks like Art House office and feels like it and smells like it and tastes like it and the dugout... And he said, you, you guys will just relive those moments that, that you guys went through during that year. So it was really an interesting thing. And I got to know Michael Lewis very well, who wrote the book, because he traveled with us. And I actually sat next to him often when we traveled. And, and I was like, kind of, I, I said, oh, so what's the uh, formula for bestseller? I mean, what's that recipe? And, or, or, uh, and he, you know, he went through the whole dialogue. And I asked Stephen the same thing. I said, so what's the formula for you know, a great movie following a book? And it, they're so disconnected. They're so much different, you know, because there has to be so much more color you know, in a movie. So anyway, it's a really exciting project. I'm really looking forward to it. And it's uh, very novel. And it's, uh, you know, to have a year off and kind of, you know, recharge that battery is really exciting to be part of a project like this. That sounds fun. I want to get to Maine Pelfrey and Shin Ming Wong. But before we do that, give us a crazy Giambi story. Come on, he's not shy about being nuts. Give us a good one about Giambi. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know what, I think what the, the, instead of a crazy story, what I'm going to say is that this is one of the kindest, most compassionate, empathetic individuals. I mean, always has time for everybody, always has a kind word for everybody. And what was great, when he won the MVP that year in Oakland, you know, we all came in afterwards and we, we all walked in, you know, in the locker room and, and there was a, you know, a box in our locker. And everybody, what he did was he, he got a Jason Giambi MVP bat and, 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 and autographed each one individually for everybody on that team for what kind of relationship. I mean, he took the time. It wasn't like a Hallmark card where, you know, you just stamp, hey, uh, you know, have a great day, love, you know, love Jason. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really a, a, a note about a special moment about who he is. I mean, he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy, and, and it, it's just so happy to see him, like, you know, get back on track to where he was because he went through some tough times, and he handled it with incredible dignity and, and, and passion. And I think the reason fans forgave him, many fans, is because he's a good guy and he's real. And in a lot of ways, he's, he's the exact opposite of A-Rod. A-Rod doesn't really know how, how he wants to act. Giambi says, I am what I am, and that's what I am. Well, he leads with his heart and soul, and, and, you, and you sense that. When people, yeah. when people are that genuine, you, you, you know that you feel it. It's just, it's just part of who they are. John Maine. Um, when, Maine. when I first saw Maine, I remember it was a couple of years ago, it was the start against the Pirates, and it was at Shea. I remember watching him, and of course, uh, Maine part of the Benson deals, as most fans will recall. And I remember watching him, and the thing that I noticed, Rick, the ball flew out of his hand very effortlessly. Mm -hmm. And I've always liked John Maine. I've always thought he's, he's had good stuff. He's, he, he competes. He's got some grit. But I also think he's at a very important stage of his career. Absolutely. He's, he's not too young. He's got to start to be a little more consistent and, and, and healthier. Do you like John Maine? And, 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 and just talk to us a bit. You know him as well as anybody. Well, you know— because we've talked about a lot about the mental part of the game, and and when you look at peak performance, uh, the the peak performance elements, you have a fundamental skill element to that, you have a physical conditioning element, and you have performance based behaviors on the third side of that triangle, which we call the peak performance triangle, you know, w which is in that Rick Dash Peterson dot com, but but the most when you look at at this level. The fundamental skills, everybody really starts to have those. The physical conditioning in, in general, everybody knows how to condition so that they... At that level. At that level. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. But, but the mental and emotional, the ability to stay focused. And, and Johnny, it was interesting because as a pitching coach, you know, that's the area that you probably spend the most time. The, the fundamental skills, that, that, those are easy. I mean, once you understand the delivery and all the time I spent with biomechanics and, and whatnot, that, that's an easy type of thing. You know, it's kind of like rearranging the furniture, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, but to get that architectural design, you know, is, is really special when you have something really different. And Johnny, when he came over to Baltimore, I remember asking him, I said, Johnny, so tell me, tell me, what do you want to be? I mean, what, what, you know, John Main, five years from now, where, where's Johnny Main? He goes, you know, I'm an I'm established big league pitcher. 
And so I said, all right, that's great. Because you want to you want to find out, like, where are guys, where, where's their head at as far as where they see themselves? But wouldn't you rather somebody say, hey, coach, I want to be the ace of the staff. I want to be the best pitcher on the team. Well, Would that take you back the wrong way? Would you say, well... No, but as long as that's realistic. And yeah. John, and if Johnny Maine said that, I'd say, wow, okay, yeah, He great. throws 94. I don't see why it's that far-fetched, N- right, early N- on? No question about it. And he's got swing and miss stuff in the strike zone. I mean, when you look at quality pitching, it's swing and misses in the strike zone. Mm-hmm. Johnny gets swings and misses in the strike zone, and he gets it with more than one pitch. He can mm-hmm. get it with a slider and his changeup to go with that. So when Johnny Maine started to come into his own – and, and the gear he won 15 games, it was interesting. He went through a rough time, but there was an issue there. He was tipping some pitches and whatnot. There were some other some things that were going on. But he was also, it was kind of like he, he, he went off, he, he had 26 consecutive scoreless innings. When you look at 26 consecutive scoreless innings, that, you know, and I, I don't know if anybody else had more than that that year. And, and then he kind of stalled out. He started having a rough time. And I remember asking him, because it was obvious to me that, you know what, he's not really comfortable, as I said earlier about Ollie, he's not comfortable walking in there and putting that cape on. He's not comfortable being in the ace. He was kind of like out of his element a little mm-hmm. bit. So you, know, you look at a way to motivate guys as a coach. So I said, all right. I said, Johnny, I said, uh, okay, you're on a Budweiser hot seat. Okay, here we go. John Smoltz. He goes, uh, John Smoltz, he's a top of the rotation guy, one of good the best golfer. guys in the league. That's what I yeah, good golfer. <laughs> Great golfer. So I wrote down his numbers. Here's his record. Here's his ERA. Okay. So I said, uh, Tim Hudson. He goes, top of the rotation guy, one of the top guys in the league. Mm-hmm. Wrote down his numbers. Here's his record. Here's his ERA. John Main, uh, he's in a rotation in the New York Mets, big league pitcher. Right, let's write his numbers down. Johnny, your numbers are better than these guys. Who are you? Mm-hmm. Who do you really want to be? Do you mm-hmm. really want to be a top of the rotation guy? Because you are, and you better you have to start looking at yourself as being one of those guys. Mm-hmm. And that's that 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 takes someone to a whole nother level, you know, a whole nother level. And and when you get to that point, sometimes you're out of your element. And if he can just relax and understand that, you know what, jo- Johnny Maine's one of the top guys in the league. And as soon as he does and exhales and says, you know what, I can do this. I'm going to do this consistently. You know, Johnny Johnny May can be something really special. I hate to do this to you because I know that you you love to expound, and, and I like to listen to it because you know a lot about pitching. But you, you got to make this real quick, 15, 20 seconds. Chin Ming Wong, uh, forget about his stuff right now, the injury. Is is that going to be a real problem? It could be. It's his, it's his landing foot, it's his left foot, and he has to be down in the strike zone. The batting average in the big leagues, the average batting average in the big leagues at the bottom of the strike zone is 220. Mm-hmm. Chin, Chin Meng Wong. In both he, leagues? or in, in both leagues. Okay. And when he's at the bottom of the strike zone, the batting average against him is about 170. So he has got to be down in the strike zone. And if there's something that's inhibiting him, and it could be his left foot, which is his landing foot. Rick-Peterson.com in studio. Rick, I appreciate you coming by. Thank right, you so great, much. Man. We'll, we'll, get, you we'll get you back. We'll get you back. Enjoyed it. And if, you know, Ali ever learns how to, you know, get a little consistency, we'll attribute it to you and say that you fixed them, even though you're not in uniform anymore. <laughs> you just got to hang on to the string and the kite. That's all. Exactly. <laughs> I'll get a quick break. Uh, coming up next, I'll see what Colin has in store for his show. Then we'll wrap it up. Get ready for Colin. Coming up next at noon, 1050 SPN New York. <laughs>